I think we ended with reliance or reserve, and then, you know, so let's look at the next thing, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Resilience. Sybil Stanton wrote a book called The 25 Hour Woman. In that she said, discipline is not on your back, needling you with imperatives. Imperative is a negative. She said, discipline is at your side, encouraging you with incentives. So resilience basically means when you are corrected, when you are corrected by the word of God, and you take this admonition that thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Again, look at it as a shepherd to a sheep. The crook in the shepherd's staff is designed to guide the sheep. The sheep are technically the dumbest animal there is. When you have a relationship between a shepherd and a sheep, technically they're useless on their own. The shepherd has to lead them, he knows each one by name, but you know, when one gets lost, he has to go find it. It's not like Lassie come home, they're not going to get back on their own. So it's a very different thing. So it says that rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The crook of the rod that is designed to gently cajole you back into, into formation is actually a comfort because the sheep is lost without the shepherd. Yes. So what we have here is a resilience that is birth and discipline. Have you ever fallen out of favor with your devotion to the degree that life is off kilter? So most days I wake up between 4.30 and 5 in the morning. Now I go to bed at 9 because after 9 is when the news comes on and pretty much, you know, they're going to tell me that it's over. Don't wake up. <laughs> and when I'm in India, of course, you know, if our love comes on, I'm just I'm scared. I'm just scared when I watch this guy. I think to myself, like, you know, what are you mad about? I mean, just calm down, dude. I mean, so I literally, you know, make sure that he doesn't go on the TV. He just literally scares me. But I go to bed early, I wake up early, because the early morning hours are the best time to have that resilience with God, to have that discipline. So from 4.30 to 5 or 5.15, I'll read something that is good, clean, pure, powerful, and positive, either devotion, whether it's Good Shepherd, whether it's the Bible, whatever it is. Psychologists have said that the first input in your mind is more powerful than the next five. So if you're waking up saying, thank you, Lord, for this morning, it's a very different outcome than if you wake up saying, good God, I can't believe it's morning already. In fact, I want to give you a suggestion. What do you call the device you set when you go to bed? Uh, yeah, see, that's your problem. What do you associate with an alarm? An emergency? Some kind of catastrophic occurrence? If you wake up scared to death, no wonder you can't perform. Start calling it an opportunity clock. You took the opportunity to set it. If you hear it, it's an opportunity to get up and go. If you didn't hear it, you might have gone. That's why we get the call set if you're on Saturday. Most of you come. But that time in the morning is precious. And I may go back to bed a little bit later. Maybe, you know, I own my own company, I, I, I do my own hours, and all of the other stuff. But there is something magical about that time of having that discipline. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. In order for that to work, you have to be uncomfortable. Hear what I'm saying? If devotion is comfortable, it's not, it's not working. One time someone said, uh, I, when I preach, I try not to meddle. I said, you're not preaching. <laughs> when you preach, they have, they have to feel that something's wrong. When Jonathan Edwards during the Second Great Revival preached, uh, people said that people were clinging on to the pillars because they didn't want to be swept away into the hell he was talking about. The damnation was so real that they were clinging on to the pillars of the church. Mentally. So this resilience requires discomfort. And I always try to articulate it this way. Earthquakes and hurricanes get all the publicity. Termites do more damage. You can make radical changes in minute steps. If you read, on average, 20 minutes a day, if you're an average reader, and I'm not talking intellectual average, I'm just talking speed, okay? Uh, because you're going to be intellectually below average like me. I'm talking about just regular, if you just
straight 20 minutes a day. At the end of the year, you will complete 20 books that are 200 pages in length. And that is 19 more than the average person invests in. In a culture that is so steeped in academia here, as soon as we finish our formal education, we think that's over. None of us crack open a book after that. And Mr. Ziegler always used to ask, how many of you read your Bible every day? A few hands would go up. How many of you read the newspaper every day? More hands would go up. He says, how many of you believe everything you would read in the newspaper? No hands would go up. How many of you believe everything you would read in the Bible? All hands would go up. It's a little interesting that we spend more time reading what we don't believe. <laughs> That's discipline. Discipline takes effort to correct when you see a mistake. I, you will never find me anywhere without something to read. I can't fast, I'm fat, I fly a lot. And most of my analogies on errant human behavior come from the airplane. <laughs> I can't believe people will get on the plane with nothing to read. And they decide, okay, you know what? For the, for the next three hours, I'm gonna be fascinated by this big fat head in front of me. <laughs> I'm going to look at it like this, and you know, they're like, and I'm like, dude, read something. And then after a while, guess what they start reading? What you're reading. <laughs> Human behavior is fascinating. And the reason is, we are creatures of habit. Aki and some of the others have seen me do this before. Uh, for those of you who watch YouTube or uh, watch me do this illustration before, play along. But just raise your right hand like this. Everybody just raise your right hand like this, everybody. Now slowly put it on your chin. See, the chin is this pointed thing at the end of the face. <laughs> <laughs> passivity to react to that which we see instead of respond to that which we believe. Reaction is based on life's possibles. Response is based on God's permissibles. Allow yourself to respond based on God's permissibles. But the reason you did that was we are convinced that the person up front with a microphone is smarter than us. See, the shepherd doesn't have to be in this illustration we're not, we're not looking at intelligence, but we're looking at the obedience of the sheep. So that discipline that takes place, that yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the dead, I'll fear no evil. But what is evil? The opposite of good. Does evil radically exist in the world? We know it. Hannah Arendt wrote a book called The Banality of Evil, where she talked about the Eichmann trial. I've been in Auschwitz. I've seen what Nazi horror did when Hitler was eliminating people at the rate of 10,000 a day, 6 million died in the Holocaust. When Eichmann, who was responsible for the final solution, the guy who introduced the Zenon pellets that put these people in the gas chambers, was caught by the Nazi Jewish hunters in Mazar that went into Argentina and captured him, the Israeli soldiers said that as he walked to his gallows, he proudly said, I don't want to be blindfolded, no remorse. He said, long live Argentina, long live Austria, long live Germany, I love you all. And he met his end. There's a YouTube clip going around about a man who was also of Germanic origin, who rescued so many people that they all filled a concert hall and this old man was sitting down and suddenly all of them yes. stood around. It's same country, same logic, same ideology, but two extremely opposite outcomes is good and evil. Evil is a natural occurrence in the world. Darkness is the absence of light. So in order to be resilient, you have to understand these components that we are fighting the forces on a daily basis. Yes. When people ask me, what do you like to read? I said, I read my Bible every day, I read the newspaper every day. That might know what both sides are up to. <laughs> Sometimes it is that direct. Uh, and I, 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 I've collected enough evidence in my travels around the world to realize that personification of evil, when you look at some of the evidences that we've seen in our own nation, 
and the culture of what people will do, the barbaric limits they will go to violate someone else, has to stem from an inner carnal desire that was never tamed in the name of humanity. Ravi talks about the fact when he was, he was in Thailand, I think. Now here's a country that has 365 temples, one for each day of the year. On one side, they're holy. Think about it, Thailand is the only country that was never occupied by anybody else. They're a proud, rich heritage. When their king died, there was national mourning, and they told all of us, when you're going to Bangkok, when you pass by the palace, show some respect. And you do, because you're on one side is all that's, that beauty, that grandeur, the architecture, the tradition, the loyalty, the respect. On the other side is the carnal lust, where, where almost 80% of the revenue is coming in the flesh trade. And Ravi says he met a lady whose, whose prime purpose was rescuing. Folks, this is going to jar you. So if you don't want to hear it, close your ears. But rescuing uh, babies, and I would say anybody under the age of three or four is a baby. So infant in their creator. In order to partake in that activity, they give you an elixir of snake venom and alcohol to so numb your senses that you could do that to a four-year-old. Evil. So what are you asking him for your resilience? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What, what, are, the, what are the rules of engagement? Uh, I was sharing with Pastor. Now, again, don't hear what I'm not saying. I have a couple of businesses, which means I meet a lot of people and I meet high-powered women from very solidly influential positions who I have to do business with as a corporate person. But I have the Billy Graham rule, I have the Zig Ziglar rule, I have the Mike Pence rule. I will not go out to lunch with a woman that is not my wife unless there are others present. I just won't do it. I never have never will. People say, well, that's a little archaic, the world is evolved. No, I don't do it because of modernity or expansion or uh, <coughs> equality. I do it because as a guy, I don't want my wife going out with some dude. <laughs> I'm just a jealous man. And if I can't have that standard, if I cannot want her to do that, I shouldn't do it either. Yes. So it's just a rule. Yes. It's not negotiable. But one lady came to our office, and I've known her many years, and she said, Krish, I'm up for an award. It's a Middle Eastern airline. Uh, and I need you to help me with my presentation. I said, not only the presentation will help you with I want to give you a victory speech in which we're going to tell you how the other four guys are going to lose to you after you've done your presentation they'll think you'll get it out of the park. And she won. She came back and said, I want to take your lunch. Uh, Victor, my, my colleague wasn't there. Nobody was there in the office. Now it's still business, you have to do it. Now what do you do? Where do you draw the line? She knows my rule, but she knew I was getting ready to travel. If I get that lunch out of the way, more business will come. There's a strategic decision to be made. So I called Anila, my bride of now 32 years. And I've been married 32 years, it's been the best 18 years of her life. <laughs> For the first 14, I had all the answers, they were wrong. Okay. I said, sweetheart, so and so has asked me to go out to lunch. I just want to let you know, on this particular day, in this restaurant, from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, I will be in front of this woman. <laughs> and Anila started laughing. She says, there's not a long line of women waiting to bounce on you. <laughs> in fact, Ours is a pity marriage, not a love marriage. I just pity you. <laughs> and I wanted to prevent any other woman on earth from ending up with this misery, so that's why I took you. I'm a kid. <laughs> so, but then after she stopped, just, you know, she kind of joking, she said, yeah, don't worry about it, no big deal. Well, a slight pause in her voice, and I could almost see her gulping. And then the innocence of the next response is why I tell the story. She said, well, what I find fascinating is that after 30 years of marriage, you still have the decency to ask me. See, that's resilience. Giving yourself permission to be corrected because it's the right thing to do. Sometimes no other explanation. Right is right, that's it. No other explanation, the right thing to do. The other day I was coming, uh, when I was flying up from Goa to uh, Delhi, uh, two guys were sitting in the, in the shuttle that takes you between the terminal and the plane. 
And pretty much this is the only land in the world where in order to get on a plane, first you got in a rickshaw, then in a car, then in a bus, eventually they'll put you on the plane. But you got to do all these other modes of transportation before they put you on the plane. And then you got to go to the merry go round thing. But these guys were sitting there, smacking their lips, chewing gum, listening to their headphones, and a lady walks up. And it does not matter what age. Does, for me, I don't give a rip what age that person is. Chivalry mandates you stand up and vacate that seat. End of discussion. Chivalry mandates. I don't care if you think that she's younger than you. A guy has to stand. And the reason is nobody taught that kid the difference between a girl and a lady. So I looked at him and I said, really? You need me to tell you to get up so this lady can sit? And he, he looked at me sheepishly as if I had intruded. Nobody, nobody, and again, I'm not doing this to raise a ruckus. I'm doing this to think, this is where we have fallen. We have created so much equality that we think chivalry has to be jettisoned. See, my mom went from being a daughter to a wife to a mother. My mother was never a lady. One of the things I started doing when I bring my mom to the West, and my mom had shocking white hair, she wore a sari, most of the time she was barefoot at home, that's how she was raised. So you know, you slap a couple of sneakers on her and you take her to the mall, she looks like a duck walking in the mall, completely out of water. <laughs> Feeling as utterly confused as humanly possible. My father is not paying any attention, he's off doing the economy. <laughs> So here she's left wondering in this big giant mall that she wants nothing from because she's simple. And then I, I just put my arm around her. And it's almost like she was looking for that perfect fit. I'm 6'1", my mom was 5'6", she looked perfectly. And you'll never see a picture of me and my late mom in the last 15 years where my mom was not around. And there's not a mother here who doesn't want her boy to work. Okay? So I said, okay, geographically, I pulled this off in the West. Can I do it in Vishakha? Where her tradition, her identity, her culture, her roots are. So I put her arm around her, and she somehow stayed. She was trying to get away, but I said, As we walked by my uncle's house, she smiled up. She said, oh, that's Ben Nana's house. I said, let him get his own mother. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek, but how many of you have paid attention to the statements from the cross? When our Lord and Savior himself thought that was the most primal relationship of all. Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold yourself. I don't make this stuff up. I do it in a different way. Uh, and some of you are not laughing for any of my jokes. We need to talk. <laughs> There's new scientific evidence. If you have a tendency to laugh and you suppress the laughter, it'll come back inside and spread your hips. <laughs> so it'll get expensive all the water. <laughs> <laughs> Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is the most pivotal part of where the psalm takes a turn. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Here write the word reputation. Howard Hendricks from Daniel Seminary said, Your careers are what you're paid for. Your purpose is what you're made for. And your purpose defines your reputation. Your reputation. Everything comes out of that reputation. What are you known for? What are you known as? What are the non-negotiables? Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, I get invited into some, some hostile environments. Uh, whether it's culturally they're different, whether it's behaviorally they're different. And some of us turn our backs on things we disagree with because we just disagree with them. But who will be the gospel to them? How do you go into the people who are disenfranchised because of identity, because of orientation, because of behavior? Who, who, will, who will be John 3.16 to them? For God so loved the world that he did not, it, 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 it's, 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 it's without any caveat. The whole world, all 7.2 billion people. Here's the irony of it. If there was only one person on earth, Christ would have died for them. That's, that's the beauty of the place. If there was only one person on earth, he would have died for you. That otherwise the gospel fails. The same thing is, who will go to these disenfranchised? 
And I'm invited. Sometimes I say, Chris, we know you come from a Judeo-Christian bent, and we know you would disagree with us on many issues, but we like the fact that you're humble enough, because I have one rule. Do not ever censor what I'm supposed to say. I'll always find some other speaker. I'll always find some other speaker. But the interesting part is, in one of those dens of inequity, where lifestyles were being compromised, I went in and proudly talked the way I did, maybe a little less evangelistic, but at least more morally driven with an e bus and a, and a bad bus, a low bus, whatever it is, the style of the substance. One guy, Rodney, who had come to study hypnotism, firewalking, and all of the things that go with partially neuro-linguistic programming and occult, looked at me and he said, while you were speaking, the spirit of the living God was hammering my heart. I was raised in a Bible-believing church. He said he left that seminar halfway through. Back. Happiest email I got was three weeks later. He says, I've gone back to the origins of what I was raised in. I've enrolled in Bible college for the Salvation Army. Moving back to Australia. And I'm going to go serve God. Heaven rejoices by one person. To what extent will you go to realize that he prepares the table for you in the presence of thine enemies? Sometimes it's amidst the hostility that the sweet aroma, the fragrance of this Christ will begin to shine. And therein lies the beauty. Thou anoises my head with oil, my cup ran it over, this is replenishing. The goal of a restored life is the belief that when you return to the word of God, the assurance of his providence is enough to refuel you. Folks, church is not a rest stop where you get ragged all week and come back and burden the pastor with your problems. I've talked to him. He has his own. He doesn't need additional problems from you. Church is a refueling stop where you take the word of God given by the shepherd of this temple and of this flock and go into the world and live it out and give it out and so you're so exhausted and so dry and so empty on Saturday you're completely exhausted because you gave out everything that was given to you and on Sunday you crawl back in here on empty so he can fill you up again. Yes. Church is a refueling stop. It's not a rest stop. And sometimes we get caught up in the wrong side of this equation. In fact, uh, <clears throat> This one pastor was, uh, he had a parishioner who was just disgruntled all the time. For whatever reason, she was, she, was, she was just perpetually angry. She never liked his sermons, always complained. And as she was nearing the end of her life, she was in the hospital. He reluctantly said, man, I have to go see her. See, the relationship was so strained, he didn't even want to see her as she was dying. And so he walked into the thing and he was petrified because he thought, man, even on the deathbed, she's going to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he went and sat down there and she was there going on and grumbling and all that. So he saw some peanuts on the side of the table. So with nervousness, he just started eating one of the peanuts after the other. She suddenly opened her eyes and saw the peanut plate was empty. As soon as she saw her eyes, he panicked because she'd always given it to him. So he said, I'm so sorry, I just ate your peanuts. She said, that's okay, I'm sorry, I ripped all the chocolate off before that. <laughs> so, so, so she was aware he was eating it, she just wanted him to finish. <laughs> well, the pastor got his revenge on one of his parishioners. Two of his parishioners were always hard on him. One was a lawyer, and the other was a banker. And so when he was getting ready to die, he asked for both of them to be by his side. And they were shocked because they always given him a hard time saying, you don't know how to run this church, you don't know how to use your finances, you don't know how to get into legal trouble. They were always giving him a hard time. But he invited them and he said, I want you by my side. And so one of them sheepishly asked the pastor, they said, Pastor, you never liked us. Why in this very uh, definitive stage of your life where this is the glory seat now on earth, you wanted both of us on either side of you. He said, our Lord died between two thieves. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to have the same privilege. <laughs> <laughs> reputation. What is your reputation? The anointing. What is your replenishing? And finally, 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, retirement. So if you look at the words, and this I wrote in a hotel in Alabama, and like I said, I'm not a learned man. But when I looked at that psalm that I had recited to get me comfort, I found the word riches, I found the word rest, I found the word relaxation, I found the word rejuvenation, responsibility, reliance, resilience, reputation, replenishing, result, and retirement. God's complete life plan, starting with the Lord is my shepherd, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How are we navigating this journey between womb to tomb? Let's take a few, uh, a digression here and then we'll, we'll finish up with Matthew. The three things I want you to take home today. First, knowing God. The power and the fear of God. He determines the number of stars and call them each by name. We have four billion stars, you can read all of the stuff, but how well do you know God? And do you know Him intimately? See, most guys will admit this. They say, I, I heard from God. Have you ever noticed that when you think you heard from God, it sounds like your wife? <laughs> and, you know, and most of the times it is. But God doesn't answer by, doesn't talk to you by email. I'm pretty sure He doesn't talk to you by she mail. <laughs> God's voice is not something to be reconciled with in terms of whether it's rich in its sound or how it comes. God's voice creates a restlessness. When you know God, He'll create a restlessness. And the rest, rest will only come when you succumb to that restlessness. When you say, I'm not going to fight anymore. Yes. January 1, 2006, I'm riding the height of corporate glory. I'm the vice president of global operations for a company that I worked 17 years, from a telemarketer to the top. I had a corner office, the office had windows, the, the actually had a view. Uh, I had someone who could bring me coffee if I needed it. I never exercised that option. I had arrived. I've now written books, I share the stage with two presidents, and God's voice was as sure as I'm talking to you today. It simply said, I've made you famous, now it's my turn. And I went and resigned. No dental benefit, no mental benefit. And suddenly the world collides. Quickly realized that in order for God's voice to be true, Anila has already got to be on board with it. So when I said, sweetheart, I resigned, she said, I was wondering when you were going to do that, you've been restless. I said, aren't you worried that we may not have a paycheck? She said, when we get to the end of our financial rope, we'll tie a knot and hang on. He prepared her before he prepared me. So this is part of that. You have to understand the apostolic thing, why you go in twos, why we talk to each other. And relationships are a whole different thing. You know, we have to follow the biblical edict. The rules were given for a reason. Anything with no head is dead. And anything with two heads is a freak, said Adrian Rogers. Anything with no head is dead. And anything with two heads is a freak. We need to have our argument. We can't be arguing all the time. See, if two people agree on everything, one of them is unnecessary. <laughs> I was talking to a bunch of young itinerants. We were in uh, Atlanta, I think, last year. And uh, I've been on the road for a long time. In the early days when we went, our companies were not even allowed to make a call from the hotel room because it was $9 to direct dial. We were given a long card, a series of numbers. We had to go to a pay phone in the phone on the corner and dial an MCI operator who connect you back. And then very quickly, I would give her the number of my hotel. So if she called from the house, it won't cost me any money. And there was a certain time. But we would talk maybe once every 72 hours. And these young people were looking at me and saying, man, I've been gone for three days. And I have a one and a half year old kid. And I think this mission work is really putting a strain on my marriage. I said, you've been gone for three days? I've had fights that lasted six years and we forgot about it. You know the problem with younger couples today? With all the, as Michael Ramsey and my colleague put it, the snap Twitter, the snap Twitter chat face, all, all, all your social media. I think the problem is you guys talk to each other too much. <laughs> I mean, we 
I, I used to come home from the road about two and a half, three weeks, and she had a baby. And I remember when my son graduated from college with a mechanical engineering degree, I'm at his graduation ceremony. The guy graduates debt free in four years on a full scholarship. Didn't cost me a dime. And I'm wiping tears of great pride as the father and suddenly realized I had done nothing. She raised the boy. I left when he was three months old. She handed me a finished product. When we were doing a marriage seminar, someone came up to us and said, how can you guys claim to know God when you're never together? How can you claim to be a marriage of, of any effectiveness and service when she has been a single mother? And I said, sweetheart, I don't know how to answer that because I'm guilty. I've never been around. She said, let me answer it. She said, our marriage was never designed to be one of proximity. It was ordained to be one of example. Can you do it? You can. If there is a person to prepare and a passion to pursue, there is always a price to pay. There is a person to prepare and a passion to pursue. There is always a price to pay. You can pay now and play later. You can play now and pay later. Either way in life you will pay and play. You decide when. How well do you know God? And do you trust Him? Uh, some of you know Dr. Ramesh Richard. Some of you may not know his name. But Dr. Richard uh, was one of the founders of Delhi Bible Fellowship. His father was Dr. John Richard who recently passed away. Ramesh teaches at Dallas Seminary. I had been bugging him to take me on the mission field. I wanted to know God. And one day the call came. He said, do you want to go with me to Egypt? Immediately I'm thinking to myself, can we find some place closer? <laughs> I mean, how about Fort Worth? I mean, can we drive to this mission field? Why does, it all, why does mission field always have to be halfway around the world? There is Judea, there is Samaria. Unfortunately, I drew the ends of the earth strong. Because I really envy my missionary friends saying, oh yeah, I'm going, uh, I'm going out uh, for my evangelism today. I'm knocking on doors in the neighborhood. Which means if a bad guy opens the door, you run back into your house. There's really no threat there. Ramesh Anna says, uh, you want to go to Egypt. But if you disagree with anything, they'll put a blindfold over you and then they'll put a, there's a very graphic video, I hate Bush. You know, that uh, ready, ready, ready to take off your head. And I'm thinking, man, I don't want to go to Egypt. But how do you tell your mentor that you don't want to go because you're afraid? I called my wife and I said, sweetheart, Ramesh has asked me to come to Egypt. She said, absolutely not. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> she said, Thanksgiving, my parents are coming from India. You're already gone so much. Now you want to start driving mission trips, uh, 120 days and 160 days. Like, when is it going to end? Is what she exactly said. I'm in a hotel room in Newark, New Jersey. I'll never forget it. Ready to hang up, and she read me the riot act. And I'm, man, I hang up the phone, call Ramesh, and I say, I really want to serve you, but since Adam, we know it's always been the woman. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, blame, blame it on Eve, and, you know, on the apple. As they say, it was, it was, it was, it was never the apple on the tree, it was the pear on the ground, okay? Just, you know, <laughs> So, but I don't know when that joke was born in time right here. Um, <clears throat> suddenly we're caught in this great crossfire of knowing God. See, I was raised in a Brahmin family. When I went and asked her parents for her hand in marriage, her father said, absolutely not. He was a pillar in the Methodist church. My wife comes from affluence. She comes from education. Her entire family is educated. Her father ran Ingraham Institute, one of the pioneering Methodist institutions which he, uh, her uncle ran YMCA, her other uncle ran CASA. This was an educated family, which means Anila was a good catch for the Christian community. The last thing they wanted was someone from the South. And in the North, they have the saying, anything from Bhopal South, Madrasi. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, and the only thing you can do to insult an Andhra is call him Madrasi. That's what you can do But my mother-in-law said, I want to take a chance on this boy. Something is telling me that God is going to do a seminal work in his life. And if this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I follow, I will be on my knees every night. Because if we say no, our daughter will obey. And Anila said, if my parents say no, I'm not marrying you. But she said, if they do agree, and it's a big if, we'll see where. But the first decision is they have to agree. I'll never go against my parents. But her mother said, 
I will get on my knees and will pray for this boy. She prayed for me for seven years every night with this word. Lord, bring him to the foot of the cross and then take away from him every part of his own identity so he would know you in the fullness and bring him back to India as an evangel for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Specific prayer. Seven years. Knowing him. Now Ramishana is calling me to go to Egypt. Anila has just read me the Ryan Act. Before I can call him, the phone rings. She said, how can I say no? She said, I asked him to bring you to church, and he did. I asked him to keep you in church, and he did. I asked him to soften your heart so the pastor's word would penetrate your own and you would give your life to him, and he did. I asked him that you would become the head of the household, and every Sunday you're in the car before anybody honking the horn saying, let's go, let's go. She said, today he's asking me for you. How can I say no? See, the choices and the chances are never going to be easy. It's not, it's, if it was easy, you know, we wouldn't have had that great line. So first, knowing God, how well do you know Him? And do you know Him enough to realize that the God of the mountaintop is also the God of the valley? Yes. yes. Amen. Amen. Do you realize that when you step out, Henry Blackaby in experiencing God says, God is next to you, He's before you, He's above you, He's beneath you, He's behind you, but He's, he's never without you. You can be alone, but you're never alone. Fascinating. Next, knowing the enemy. <laughs> if you know God, you need to know the enemy. What is the enemy in your life? Is it voyeurism? And I mean, I, 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 I may ruffle a few feathers here. Uh, maybe, in fact, I will take this detour. I'm going to excuse the ladies from this for a second. Because within created order, God has given you the ability to love like none other in all of his creation. But guys, we have missed the boat. Do not let your children walk around with a hole in their heart where your blessing should be. As a father, bless your children. I have an affirmation I share with my son. Son, I may never gather diamonds. I may never amass gold. My colleagues may consider me a failure when my business life is told. But if you can grow up godly, my boy, I'll be glad for I know I'll have been successful as your dad. Bless your children. Do not let them walk around with that hole. <coughs> I'll never forget, I was doing this, I did this exact same thing at a secular talk, but I shared that poem I shared with my son at an insurance event right here in Bombay with the Renaissance, which is the one on the water there, yeah. There were about a thousand people in the dentist. And when I finished, this man comes up to me and he falls at my feet. He's from another faith. And he says in Hindi, he says, Saji Apito Dilduka. That's a manic idea. He said, Bot Pasakamalia. Got four cars. Cha cha gadiya. Do do imported it. That's an man. He said my son hates me. I said I'm really sorry. He says nay. You've given me the reason why. He said maine kabhi sar ke par hath rakh ke beta ko barkat nahi diya. I have never blessed my child. <laughs> Imagine a bankrupt existence. What profit the man began the whole world and was a soul in the profit. What a bankrupt existence to live. See, if my boy ever came to me and said, Pop, if you had so freely given me the advice you dispensed all over the world, I would not be a broken-hearted son, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be devastated. But today, if you ask my boy, did you ever miss your father in all the days he traveled? He said, absolutely. I said, how do you feel? He said, I let him go because I knew who would tell them about Jesus and my father didn't go. And then I said, what is the second, what is the most important thing you have learned living in our house? He says, that you love mom and you're not afraid to express it. I said, what does that mean to you? He says, it means I'll never have to choose. You two are one. What, a, what an affirmation to get from a child. That he thinks the parent are one. He doesn't think of them as mother and father. He thinks of them as parent. That is biblical. That when we leave and cleave, we try to give hierarchy statements as to who will be as who and all that nonsense. In fact, we used to have a, we used to have an Anila and I had a fight, and we used to have disagreements. Of course, we have disagreements. We're human. Uh, you know, the fact that she's wrong has nothing to do with it. <laughs> Please erase that from the video. <laughs> Trust me, all my jokes, all my jokes are approved by her. Okay, just want to let you know. So, the one thing about that togetherness that. 
standing in that definitive way of saying, there is an enemy. And where is it that an enemy can exist in a space you create that doesn't have God? <laughs> so in your marriages, if there is a space of resentment, I mean, I counsel a lot of young kids when they're getting married. Man, they spent so much time planning the wedding. No time planning the marriage. They'll go off on their honeymoon, they'll come back. By accident, this fellow will leave the toothpaste cap off. And Third World War will erupt. Suddenly, the sweet woman who was, who was so enchanting as a bride becomes Hitler. <laughs> we say, what happened to the honeymoon when she grows horns and she gets mad over a tooth cap? Toothpaste cap. Because we major in minors. See, my wife has been ravaged by health issues. She suffered from a lower intestinal dose, and it's quite, I don't want to get into the graphics of describing it, but every two months she has to go for an infusion, almost a chemo. Three, minutes, three hours she's strapped up to a tube. You will never meet a more meek, humble, beautiful person who has never once begrudged the fact that I ride at the front of the plane and take limo rides and share the stage with celebrities, and she was left back with diapers and laundry. You'll never see her. But as her body began to change, with the ravages of medicine and the steroids, and the beautiful girl that I had married began to change physically. She suddenly became more attractive to me than she was on our wedding night because I now learned to love her through his eyes and I see someone who is forgiven and healed. How do you look at the people in your lives? No God. But folks, the enemy is at work. Yes. The enemy wants to destroy your marriages. The enemy wants to introduce addiction into your children. The enemy wants to, to bring gambling, the enemy, anything that is a vice. You know the old saying, uh, when the good get going or the great or whatever, they, no, when the good get going, the devil gets busy. In fact, there's a, there's a George Clooney movie which is based on the Odyssey, the old, uh, the old Greek tragedy, and uh, there's actually a scene in that movie where George Clooney is going along with two guys, and all three of them are escaped convicts. And they come to a crossroads and they pick up a guy by the name of Tommy. Tommy wanted to be a musician and Tommy gets in the car and he said, Tommy, where are you going? He says, oh, I'm going to become a star. I just sold my soul to the devil. That's kind of a musical movie. Uh, <clears throat> oh, brother, where are you? Great, great soundtrack. Uh, one of the guys decides to go down to the river. Let's go down to the river, pray, go down to the river, and they get baptized. So the two guys who escaped with Cloney in the car from the prison uh, in the car have just become Christians. And they just pick up Tommy and sold the soul of the devil. And Clooney is driving happily along with a little well-oiled hair. He says, I guess at this point it leaves me the only one in this car unaffiliated. See, the devil won't bother you as long as you're no bother. The moment you make a decision, trust me, he will wake up. Know God, know the enemy. But also know victory. When the shepherd was about to retire sheep, and I showed that about you. Okay. So now Matthew, just look at it to the end, and we'll go back to shepherd and sheep, and then we'll begin to wrap up. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31 and all the way to the end, is that is that pivotal parable where he talks about the goat and the sheep. He separates them, brings the sheep to the right, the goats to the left. To the sheep, he says, those of you who are on the right. Uh, our Father will receive you in righteousness because when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was incarcerated, you came to see me. When I was ailing, you took care of me. And they said, when did we do this? And he says, what you did to the least of these, you have done to me also. To the goats, the same thing. You will get damnation because when I was thirsty, you did not give me drink. When I was hungry, you did not feed me. When I was incarcerated, you never came to see me. When I was ill, you never came to take care of me. When did we do that? What you didn't do to the least of me. You did to me also. Interesting, huh? What you did to them glorifies. What you didn't agonizes. So sometimes we are more, more judged by what we didn't do than what we did do. So during the course of the day, 24 hours, what are many things you didn't do? And it's very fascinating. I was in Hyderabad uh, at uh, one of the big churches there in Secunderabad, in uh, Arlene Stubbs Church. And I was sharing a message 
And I think I covered some of these things about what you did to Lisa. Well, when we pulled out of the, of the church, there were a bunch of lepers there. And my window happened to be rolled down because I was saying bye to some people and I forgot to roll up my window. Now, I grew up in Vishakhapatnam where we had a leper colony pretty close to where my mother and uh, my grandmother had her home. And in Ghaziabad, we have one right next to where my, my mother and my mother used to work in those leper colonies. But we've grown up with the stigma, whether you watch the movie Ben-Hur or you watch anything else, you go to Law of Leviticus, it talks about this kind of pigmentation is clean, this kind of, you know, it's very specific. Skin disorder has been described in, <clears throat> in ancient text. It was always, in all worldviews, it was considered a stain on society. In fact, within the Hindu worldview, if you contract leprosy, they take you to the outskirts of town and leave you, and they come back and perform your death rites. You're done. Okay? So the window is open, and this leper with just nubs, and the, you know, they use a gunny sack or whatever, and it's not contagious. Only if you're in proximity and fluid. And I've studied on this, and I'll explain why. Well, I was so petrified to get away from that situation, but I'd be a hypocrite, I just spoke about it. And they're all watching, I haven't even left the parking lot. into my pocket whatever I could and I ended up giving her 500 rupees. This was the old notes, I think. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. So, not fine, whatever it was. Whatever, I gave her a ton of money and someone else stuck her hand in and that hand touched me. And I quickly gave some money in it and the car fortunately turned. I'm not kidding you. For the 45 minutes it took me to get to my hotel, I, I, I held my hands like this, pretty sure I had touched a leper. Uh, I felt unclean, I felt scared, I felt violated, but I also was humiliated because I had just been discovered that I'm a hypocrite. And I went to that hotel and I washed my hands raw. I washed them raw. And I was pretty sure still that, you know, uh, I'm a hypochondriac by nature. I get a headache, I'm pretty sure I'm done. I'm done. You know, so in fact in Hawaii one time I called my wife and I said, uh, I think I'm having a heart attack. She said, How long has it been going on? For four hours. She said, It's not heart attacking. It's, it's, it's heart attack. You'll be dead. You're going to have it for four hours. No wonder. Thank God you didn't get into medical school. When I was in the hotel that afternoon, the phone rings. When I was preaching that morning, a director by the name of Anish Daniel was sitting in the audience. He had done some work for CNBC and all. For whatever reason, the Spirit of God put on Anish's heart that I could help him with the project. He found my number through our post at RGIM. And he says, can I come see you? I said, sure. I literally wanted to do something because I was, I'm sitting here watching my hands. And I go down to the coffee shop and he puts a script in front of me. It's a script on the life of Graham Stains, who had labored for 35 years at the Australian Leprosy Mission Board's uh, thing in Baripada. And Graham was the third, because he was martyred with his two boys, Philip and Timothy. I took that script back to the United States, and my dear friend Victor Abraham produced that movie, with Stephen Baldwin playing the role of Graham Stains. Sherman Joshi plays the role of a journalist, it's completely, all production is finished, we're now shopping distribution rights, and it's quite amazing. It's a major, major production, I mean, it was a, it was, he spent no cost at telling the story. I got to meet Gladys Staines in Maripara. I went to the gravesite of where Graham, Timothy, and Philip were martyred, uh, and I actually sat and ate lunch prepared by le former lepers. How God works. I'm thinking to myself, he said you were so scared that the outcast touching you would somehow disfigure you. With what face are you worshiping me? With what face are you worshiping me? That's why I tell people, you know, Christians act like they're the ones on the cross. 
<laughs> Most of the time. Paying the price is easy. Evaluating the cost is hard. We're going to open it up for questions if you have any comments. If you disagree with anything I say, just slap the person next to you. Okay. I'll know you're upset. So. Anybody have a question for me, a comment, a snide remark? We can entertain a few, but I know I've already kept you longer than most preachers do. So. Well, this one pastor lost his watch and kept telling him, oh, I lost my watch and that's why I went over. And I said, watch? We've been looking at the calendar. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? I have a question with the present situation that we are in right now. Uh, with regards to the promotion of something called feminism, how do you bridge the gap with regards to that by saying that we are all equal? And uh, are you already married or engaged? You know, <laughs> yeah. Don't make those statements in public. You, you just alienated a few who were looking at you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, so it's, no, but you're asking an interesting question. If you ask a lady that question, she will answer the way I answer. Everybody likes to be treated with respect. We, at the same time we want equality, we also create objectification. See, Madison Avenue is selling a version of vanity that is false. For example, uh, women's dress sizes start at zero. Zero is not a size, it's not even a number. It's ridiculous. But objectification begins because of what the world is trying to create as perfection. Men, by the same reason, are not being trained to be men. See, when our Lord and Savior in Jewish tradition, that's why. See, I've been working in American prisons for the last 25 years. In American prisons, they classify incarceration and they classify every ethnic group incarcerated. The Jewish community is the only one that has a percentage so small of imprisonment that they don't even have a category. What has the Jewish father done since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What has the Jewish father done during the time of our Lord? Lord, bless, God bless you, my son. I love you, my son. And then I hug her a kiss. So the father is treating the son to be a man. So our Lord and Savior went into his father Joseph's workshop, according to Jewish tradition, must have been around 15. His ministry didn't start until 30. Which means that the 15 years away with his father, this guy's holding nails, pretty sure that he knows because he's the son of God. But what is his father teaching him? The Greek word is stepped on. His father is teaching him to become a skilled carpenter. So this rite of passage, fathers need to treat their sons to be men. Uh, the incident, day before yesterday, I was in Ghaziabad with my father-in-law and my father. My father is 84, my father-in-law is 86. Uh, my father-in-law is holding my father's hand because he's older. And both of them are bragging on, my, on their grandson, my boy. And I thought, how beautiful is this because that one man raised the girl to be a princess. And the other raised his son to treat her like one. So the feminism is a societal construct. It has nothing to do with created order of men being men and women being men. See, I'm going to make a statement and as soon as I say it, you're going to think I'm sexist. Men are better than women at being men. <laughs> <laughs> women are better than men at being women. Why don't we leave that alone? We have to create this other, that's society's construct. So anytime you bring a moral law that is society's opinion, it violates God's ordained purpose. It doesn't take away from headship. That's never said. If you look through the Bible, the most authoritative people are women. So that's a, that's a nonsensical argument that some people make on the other side. But I really think that we'll get away from this duality of name calling and labeling and Me Too and feminism and all of that if fathers raise their sons to be honorable, respectful men, not to objectify women. Uh, my mother would only say, you don't have a sister, but make sure that every girl out there is someone's, is someone's. You know, she would make very poignant statements saying that you can do anything in life, but if you ever disrespect a girl, you will have dishonored me. These are things we need to train. We make everything taboo except that most important thing, because that's the union that lasts 40, 50 years. Everything else is an addiction that has time. So my solution has always been fathers need to raise their children to be men and to treat women with respect. 
You will never solve the crime problem, the objectification problem, the feminist problem, till we solve the father-son problem. That's so. That may not have helped you because you're still, you're still looking. <laughs> In fact, I speak with authority because when I saw Anila, August 16, 1982, she was standing in the other line registering for classes. I was standing in this line registering for classes. I don't know how I ended up in that line registering for her classes. But <laughs> as soon as I saw her, I knew my search was over, at least for the semester. <laughs> but here we are 32 years later. And the reason I say that is, I was as crazy as the day is long. I somehow knew the moment I saw her that that was a girl that was going to go way out of my league. Economically, financially, academically, she was just way out of my league. She had a house that had a compound. <laughs> I had friends who had that. <laughs> I walked up to her the first day of class in IMD Gaziabad when the bell rang. I walked up to her and said, Will you marry me? She said, Get away from me, creep. <laughs> I went back the next hour, and I say it was that frequent, but it was. Almost every hour after the bell rang, as she walked by me, I said, so now will you marry me? All just saying that, you know, hey, I've given you an hour, I'm bringing new evidence, say three, but you have not had an hour to think. December 23rd, 1983, almost 13 months later, she said yes. I said yes what? I'd forgotten the question. <laughs> are very hard now is you guys do everything online. We have to stand in line. <laughs> because if you're rejected in line, everybody has seen you fail. Online if she says no, who cares? <laughs> but if you're rejected publicly in line, that's why all our marriages work because you have one shot. <laughs> and you never have the guts to ask her till you are pretty sure she's not going to shoot you, report you to the police or kill you. <laughs> But I think what's happened is we have made our society very fleeting. And what you just used as a word is feminism and how can they coexist. And the reason we're struggling with that is anything we can, hear me carefully, this is the, this is the, this is the serious part. Anything we cannot comprehend, anything that ceases to be coherent to us, anything that challenges us, we label. It's easy to put it under a label because then it becomes, see, here's the thing. Uh, Evie Hill, I think is his name, he says, I'm tired of all these isms that should have been wasms. <laughs> everything, is, everything is an ism. And hear me think, anything that is not clear, anything that's not coherent, anything we cannot comprehend, we put a label on it. And hopefully that will so, Right? Anybody else? Matthews. Matthews. Sorry? Close on Matthews. I did not do, I did the shepherd. Yeah. Re Revelation, it finishes, you don't want me to get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the other side. So. <laughs> so. All right, that's, yeah, I think we have one more question. Yeah, real quick. Do you see Nazism at the workplace? How do you testify God at the workplace? Huh. Question I get asked a lot, and, and, and a good question is how do you justify God in the workplace? See, your workplace practices the Ten Commandments. They just don't want to admit it. Try stealing. <laughs> See how long the job lasts. Try coveting the manager's wife. <laughs> See how long it lasts. Try committing murder. We actually practice the Ten Commandments, we just don't want to call them that. America right now you know, is the most godless nation in the world, founded on Judeo Christian identity. The Supreme Court justices that are defending this nonsense actually have the Ten Commandments on the Supreme Court. They would violate their own oath and be be wrong if they actually practiced what they took an oath to. So we actually see, one thing, I hear a lot of well-meaning Christians use this word, there is no such thing as a Christian business. Businesses don't go to heaven. They're just Christians working to come. But what is your non-negotiable? What is your moral ethos? So you don't, you, you don't try to explain God to someone in a marketplace that doesn't understand it. John Lennox says that good news is only good news if people think their lives are bad. Most of the people I'm sharing life with uh, drive better cars and we live in better houses.
to me, what am I saving them from? They don't have misery index. So what I try to do is I always try to position the nature of the tri-dimensional nature of God. That man is God. God has designed man to be tri-dimensional. We're mental, physical, and spiritual. And we're frustrated because we're reeking out an existence in a two-dimensional way. So if you approach it philosophically and begin to challenge them, then you can introduce it to colleagues, to co-workers. But as far as the Christian ethos in the marketplace, technically all companies are already running it. Unless they're violently cheating, and in, in which case you don't want to be there to begin with. But that's the whole nature of it. Um, I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on what we are supposed to do. But one of the other statements from the cross was, it is finished. If it is finished, what are we stopping? We try a new program every day, not because we think it brings people closer to God. It brings us more relevant to some work that we think. We want God to use us. See, stop praying, God, use me. Start praying, God, make me usable. And the potter will mold you into something that is to be used in a field. See, I did not want to give up my corporate position uh, when I was speaking in nice stadiums and doing, you know, being ridden on limos and flew in helicopters and private jet uh, to do this. But when I said, God, make me usable, he transformed me for something he saw that only I can do. Amen. God, make me usable. So, all right. I'll turn that to Give yourself a big hand. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for bringing your word to us, making the word relevant to us. Thank you for Psalms 23. You are our shepherd. Yes, God. We thank you that you are our Father. You are our shepherd. We thank you for the richness and the blessing that is there in your word. The strength and the hope that is there in your word. The life, the future that is there in your word. We thank you and bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord calls his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious and merciful to you. All God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great day.